about whether or not I was justified in saying that the neoclassical theory of value is completely unscientific. I'm going to develop this theme in this talk and I'm using as a point of reference the epicycle theory in astronomy. Now, nowadays the term epicycles is used as a term of condescension. It refers to the ancient Greek theory of lunar and planetary motion uh, put forward by Apollonius, Hipparchus and Ptolemy. It was later replaced by Kepler's model and then Newton's. Nowadays it's seen as an example of Baroque complexity in theory. But I'm going to show that compared to neoclassical economics, compared to Samuelson's economics, Ptolemy's epicycle theory was a model of scientific thought. The epicycle theory was an early scientific theory. It made pretty exact predictions and, and this is an important point, it was also potentially falsifiable. In contrast, I will show that neoclassical value theory is far more Baroque. We can say quantifiably how more Baroque it is. It makes only vague predictions and it is unfalsifiable by any conceivable empirical data. Now, what was this epicycle theory? What problem was Ptolemaeus here trying to solve? How well did it solve it? And why was the theory eventually rejected? Now, I'm going to show that it's actually more sophisticated than you may have realised. And I'm going to deal with it in its simplest form. I'm not dealing with the epicycle theory of the motion of the planets, Venus, Mars, etc. I'm only dealing with the simplest case of epicycle theory, which is the theory of the moon's orbit. Now, the simplest idea you might have is that the moon goes round the Earth in a center, in a circle, with the Earth at the center of the circle. But there are, are two problems with this that were apparent to astronomers in the ancient world. The first is the change in the apparent size of the moon. It doesn't always look the same size. And its speed of movement against the background of the fixed stars varies. Let's look at the issue of size first. At certain times in its orbit, the moon is visibly closer to us. When you get what's called a supermoon, it's 14% bigger than a full moon that is not in the supermoon position. So if it is visibly closer to us, it can't be going around in a perfect circle. So the path can't be circular. It must have some non-circular element to it. Also, when it's a supermoon, it seemed to move more rapidly against the background of the fixed stars. So not only is the motion evidently not circular, it's not uniform either. So it's not uniform circular motion. It has to be some other type of motion. So then this is something that they were driven to by empirical observations. Now, I've drawn here the Earth and the Moon, and here is a perfect circle. When the Moon appears as a supermoon, when it's in perigee, or the closest position to the Earth, the distance has to be less than the average radius of the circle. And when it's furthest away, the distance has to be greater than the average radius of the circle. So the perigee and apogee, uh, Greek for, for, um, astronomical terms for these positions. And they needed to have a theory to account 
for this variation in distance, which they could observe. The theory they came up with, there were, there were two theories. There was the epicycle theory and the deferent theory, but let's look at the epicycle theory first. It answers both problems. It said basically there is a major cycle which moves around anti-clockwise and is the main orbit. On top of that, the moon orbits around a point on this main cycle, a rotating point on this main cycle, in the opposite direction. Now, in the supermoon position, the little cycle brings the Earth and the moon closer together so it looks larger. In the opposite phase, the little cycle takes the moon further away from the Earth so it looks smaller. Now, because the motion of the two is in the opposite direction, when well the moon is coming down here, the motion of the epicycle adds to the angular velocity of the moon and makes it appear to move faster against the fixed stars. On the other hand, when the moon is over here, it is moving up on the main cycle and down on the epicycle. So its angular velocity is slower. So the epicycle theory accounted for both the observations. It accounted for the moon being closer at apogee and it accounted for the variation in angular velocity of the moon at different points. Now this is all you normally get shown when you're told about the epicycle theory. You, you're given a diagram of a circle and you're giving these little circles and it's made to seem totally implausible. When you actually look at the path that's traced out, it's somewhat more elegant. Here is the uniform circle and the blue path is the path that Ptolemy claimed the moon actually followed. So it's not an ellipse, but the epicycle shape is still a uniform curve. Well, still a smooth curve, not a uniform curve. It, an important point here is that you have to have an epicycle in which the small cycle occurs twice for every large cycle to get this effect. If it only rotates once every cycle, you actually get an elliptical orbit, but you don't get the epicycle rotations in the right phase so that it, you get accelerations both here and here, which is not what you want to see. Now the nice thing about this is that it could be calculated and you could make predictions from it. You could calculate it either using compasses and rulers, by using large compasses and rulers and taking measurements, you could predict where the moon was going to be, or you could use mechanical computers. Now, there was an equivalent model, the uh, deferent model, which instead of having the moon moving in a circle around this point here, you had the center of the moon's orbit, you had the moon moving in a big circle, and the center of the moon's orbit, the deferent, rotated around the Earth. But geometrically, these are both equivalent, and you get the same uh, results. The thing about this model here, though, is it's easier to build a mechanical computer that deals with it. Uh, it wasn't suspected, and really, until the 1950s that the Greeks had mechanical computers, but one was retrieved in the early 20th century by divers, and starting in the 50s and later, more recently, using tomography, people have been able to x-ray this corroded mechanical computer and work out 
what the components of it are. Um, it turns out that it uses epicyclic gears and it uses offset gearing, which does a literal implementation of the deferent model of the lunar orbit. Um, this is a, a reconstruction of what some of the wheels were. This is an exact. These are modern epicyclic gears to show you what an epicyclic gear is. Accurate modern models have been made of it, and it's possible using this to do good predictions of where the moon's going to be in the sky. Its angular motion is varying angular motion is handled and from that you can predict when lunar eclipses and solar eclipses are going to occur. So the um, the dials allowed these predictions to be made. So it actually is a scientific theory. People are able to make predictions from it and precise predictions. One of the interesting points about Ptolemy is that he also constructed accurate maps of Europe. And to construct those accurate maps, you need no information about longitude. The modern world wasn't able to accurately compute longitude until the chronometer was invented. And whilst the ancient Greeks probably didn't have chronometers, the type of mechanical computer there would enable them to take readings of the angular position of stars at the moment when a lunar eclipse started. And from that, you can work back to get longitude. So those mechanical computers could have been used for map making. There are flaws in the Ptolemaic theory. Because the, the orbit isn't actually elliptical, but has these three lobes, there are actually th it predicts three positions in the orbit when the Earth will look small. And this, in principle, could be observable and would conflict with real observations. So it's not a, a foolproof theory. It predicts things we don't see. The modern theory, of course, is that the moon orbits in an ellipse and the ellipse causes it to be closer at this point and further away. And the difference in angular motion is due to Kepler's law, which says that in equal time, equal areas are swept out by an orbiting body. And this is due to the conservation of angular momentum, as we now know. Now. The diagrams I've drawn exaggerate the eccentricity by about three times. This is a more realistic diagram, a to scale diagram of the eccentricity of the orbits. And you can see that the black ellipse is only slightly off the red circle. And the Ptolemaic epicycle orbit is again only slightly off. As I said before, if you think epicycles are odd and ellipses are normal, it's worth taking into account that if you have an epicycle that rotates once every rotation of the main orbit, you actually get an ellipse. If I change in my algorithm the rotation rate of the epicycle, I get this blue orbit, which is elliptical. It's an exaggerated degree of eccentricity compared to the observed lunar eccentricity. Um, shows an, uh, an orbit of twice the uh, eccentricity it should. So that, that one is no good. But if the idea that epicycles are odd which we have is so strong, we shouldn't think that because 
and LIPS is actually something that an epicycle will generate. The only difference is that we know that rather than being at the midpoint of the ellipse, the Earth is at one of the fo two foci of the ellipse. So why is Newton's and Kepler's theory better? Basically, it's down to economy of information. For the solar system as a whole, all we need is the angular momentum, radius, and rotational phase for each planet at time zero, and the laws of motion give us all the rest. That's three numbers per planet. For the Ptolemaic system, we need at least two radii, the radii of the main circle and the epicycle. We need two rates of rotation, the rate of rotation of the major and minor circle, and two starting phases. So that's six numbers per planet. So compared to the Newtonian theory, the epicycle theory has a twofold redundancy. In my next video, I'm going to go on to apply epicycle theory to market prices and to show that even epicycle theory for all its weaknesses, is a whole lot better than the theory put forward in standard textbooks on the, the same kind of um, scientific basis as the reason we take Ptolemaic epicycle astronomy still to be a scientific theory.